so we will do among the last of our recursive examples which is string edit distance the problem notation indices were perhaps not set up in enough detail or care last time so we will uh, set up the indices and the meaning of everything very clearly then we'll write recursive code for it okay. so the problem was that there is a source string s or in the code called ess s okay. and that takes on indices of characters between say 1 and uh, n And there's a target string to which I want to transform it. So I want to go from source to target. And uh, t goes from 1 through m, say. Now, the question we are asking is, what is the smallest number of operations to transform s of 1 through n to t of 1 through m and we call that um, see in the code dist and in symbols just d okay. that's the distance so that we call that d of n uh, say m n Now, so here is the string S, here is the string T, and to answer that question, we first ask what is the last character in each of them. Okay. So the first decision point is whether S um, N is equal to uh, T of uh, M. If that is the case, then we uh, look for a smaller problem to solve, which is to transform this to that, because the last character is already the same. So in that case, my cost will be just d of m minus 1, n minus 1. These are all possibilities. I mean, even though the last characters are the same, the best way to transform s to t may not be to solve that. Okay. It may well be that this string is much longer and it has an exact match in the prefix and you only append things to that and that's the best way. We don't know that. But this is one of the possibilities, that we don't pay anything for the last character and we recursively solve smaller problems. Okay. The other possibility is that these are not equal and we decide to replace. So this is like the option shorten each, shorten all the, both the strings. In the other case, I end up with a recursive cost of 1 plus dm minus 1 n minus 1, uh, this is the replace action. So I pay one unit for taking this character and replacing it to that character and then I solve the smaller problem recursively. Okay. That leaves to two other cases which is that these are not equal and the way I try to address it is in this case it looks like t is longer. So maybe uh, what I'll decide to do is, I'll say this is t of 1 through m. Okay. So I'll write down the script as first okay, 1 transform s 1 through n to t 1 through m minus 1 and then append 2 append t m to t. Okay. 
that's a perfectly valid way to build up T from S. All right? So in that case, the cost will be what? So there's cost of 1 for appending. And the previous cost, by definition, is D of M minus 1 N. The counterpart to that, although this string looks longer, there may well be a solution where I actually first transform. So the cost in this case will be the symmetric opposite, 1 plus D of M n minus 1. I'm trying to translate that into the right steps. So I transform this part to the whole thing. Okay. So transform uh, S 1 through n minus 1 to T 1 through M. Okay. So first transform this to the whole string. And then drop the last one, just ground it. We can also do it before. Okay, the ordering doesn't really matter. Uh, delete S N. Okay. So if you wanted to do it in that order, then you can say this is step one, that is step two, and therefore the cost is one plus D M and N minus one. So now there are these four cases. The four cases are so shorten, replace. Uh, let's give it a name. So because I'm appending something after the transformation, let's call that the append option uh, or uh, insert option. So, and this is the delete action. Okay. So now the Cost at MN, okay, so D MN can be written as the minimum of the four costs. Okay. But of course, the first cost applies only if they're equal. The last characters are equal. So I'll just write that in condition. Okay. This will be D M minus 1 minus 1, if so and so. 1 plus D minus 1, 1 plus D. With all the action clauses. Fine. So every DMN is defined like that, recursively in terms of, uh, so if you think of D as a table, as I started out saying, uh, we'll define a special row and column called 0, which will make things easier. And then 1, 2, up to something, 1, 2, up to something. Now, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, if you start with an empty string, so let's say this is what S is, this is what T is. So this column means S is empty. And I want to build up longer and longer Ts. From empty to empty, the cost is obviously 0. And then to build longer t's, you have to just keep on appending those characters. That is the easiest, best way of doing that. So this row is kind of fixed. Similarly, to take a long s and then truncate it down to 0, you have to get rid of all its characters. So that will be again 1, 2, etc. So the upper and left column and row are easy to decide. Now observe that in the recursion, we only look for cells which is 1 to the left or 1 up or both. So that means that once these two quantities are defined, we can fill in the rest of the table or recursively compute D for all the other values. Okay. So that's the setup. And the code may have a slight uh, discrepancy in terms of rows and columns. Um, but once you read it offline, it should be OK. So how do I do this? I read in S and T from AV1 and AV2. 
And then since in C++ the default is that the string's first character is at offset zero, which I don't want. I wanted to use that band for keeping the base values. So I insert at position zero one character, which is some dummy underscore. Okay. And then similarly with T, and then I dist here is an implementation of D. D there implicitly assumes that S and T are like global variables. I didn't want to do that. So I'm passing S and T explicitly as parameters to dist. But here I am giving the last slot. Okay. There also I'm giving the last slot. And then I'm just printing out the distance and finishing up. Now, how does distance work? So, distance takes uh, S and I and T and J. Okay. So, all right. Uh, remember that they're originally initialized with their own size minus ones. All right. So, I'm looking at the last character in the outermost level of the recursion. So, the depth is a Again, like a previous variable to help us print rest statements properly. Now, here are print statements. Let me enable the first print statement. Actually, uh, let me do that a second later. Now, if i is equal to 0, then I have to return j. If j is equal to 0, I have to return i. That's the definition of the upper and left bands. Otherwise, I initialize best to effectively plus infinity in the integers. And if the last characters match, s i is equal to t j, then we have to shorten both of them. Okay. So the recursive call just becomes dist of s i minus 1, t, t and j minus 1. Okay. So map it to m n n as you wish, doesn't really matter. And the recursion depth has increased by 1, so it's 1 plus depth. What is best? So best has started with infinity, and depending on what case I'm doing, I'll keep on taking the minimum of the old best and the next solution. So best becomes minimum of best and shorter. If the last characters do not match, then there are these three options, deletion, insertion, and replacement, as we discussed. And then those are exactly the calls as I implemented on the board. So one of the indices goes down to minus one, and I add one, or for replacement, both the indices go down by one, and I add minus one, uh, and I add one for the cost of replacement. Yes? Sir, if you are giving the depth as a parameter, sir, hmm. won't it be become zero no, so this is like a messy C++ facility, if you will, uh, which is if you make a call without giving that last parameter, then that default will kick in and you'll get depth equal to zero. If you provide it explicitly, then that equal to zero will not take effect. Uh, so now let's compile this. So if you do that, it prints the array distance as three. Um, so if I append that, it's five, so things are okay. Now, um, and this should be able to deal with all kinds of things. For example, A, B, C, kitten, that is three, okay. I should be able to do kit A, B, C, D, E, 10. Let's see what happens, A, B, C, D, E. So it can figure that out. If you're doing insertion deletion anywhere, it's good enough to understand the best thing to do. Sometimes you may get unintuitive results. It might prepare a problem, but you may not see the shortest edit sequence. And then, but this will get the right thing always. Now let's do one thing, which is enable these trace statements to see what kind of recursive calls are happening. First, I will enable the trace with the depth, so you see how the nesting works. Even for very small problems, uh, this will get fairly difficult to interpret on screen. Fibonacci was easy. Okay. Uh, permutation was easy. This is going to be complicated because in that table, any the last element is going to recursively call the previous three. Those are going to call in all kinds of ways. Okay. Um, so I'm going to use the smallest small example here. And I have to do less because you'll see that huge number of calls will result. So dist 6, 7, calls dist 5, 7, calls dist 4, 7, et cetera. Okay. This is the first place where a base case happens. 0, 7, you don't need to recurse anymore. Okay. And then dist 1, 6 happens. That again calls a base case. So base cases are zero with zeros. Otherwise, you keep recursing. 
this enormous space just to compute the area distance between a six character string and a seven character string. You just keep going and going. The print takes more time than the final answer. So if you enable the print, it just goes on forever. Lot of recursive calls. And part of the reason is that just like Fibonacci, which was repeating computation, this is also repeating computation. Look, here is disk 01, here is disk 01. Here is disk 11, there is disk 11. So the same disk is being called multiple times because there are so many paths from MN to any IJ. So some of you know how to compute the number of such paths. It's exponential. Okay, the number of paths from 00 to MN okay, is quite large. And that's what's happening. All such paths have to be accounted for in the recursion. So suppose you want to actually count it, then I'm going to disable the indent and just print something with dist. Okay. And remember that old trick to grep it for dist and pipe it through sort, then pipe it through unique. Okay. So any distance, uh, let's do the old example. So I, I catch the lines with pattern disk, then I sort, then I unique it, and I less it. So this 00 is called 299 times. In each case, it returns 0. This 01 is called 482 times. This is just for a string which is like, you know, uh, kitten and sitting. Okay. So these are all redundant calls because this is a pure function. And every time this 01 is called, it returns this exact same thing. Okay. Um, so you can see the situation. And this 6, 7 is the last one, which is just called once. Looks somewhat similar to Fibonacci, and it is exponential. The number of calls to lower dist functions. So this is why, uh, in such cases, there is this other technique called dynamic programming, where you realize that your solution has a natural recursive structure. But if you coded it up using pure recursion, what would happen is you would reach the same subproblem again and again, like Fibonacci. Okay. Ideally, that Fibonacci tree should have been a, we should have common factored all the nodes which were known, right? So to draw you a picture, we shouldn't have evaluated them separately. So suppose Fibonacci of, let's pick something manageable and small. So if I have Fibonacci of, say, 4, that is Fibonacci of 3 and Fibonacci of 2, this is Fibonacci of 2 and 1, 2 is 1 and 0, 2 is 1 and 0. So instead of that massive replication of nodes, the correct thing to do would have been that I say line up 0 and 1, I get 2, okay. 3, instead of going to that one, this represents that I don't compute it again. I just cache it somewhere and use that value. Okay. And then 4 uses 3 and 2. So here every node appears exactly once. Okay. So this means that I'm reusing old values without computing them and spreading them out into a tree. So I'd like to do similar things with edit distance as well. And the way to do that is to uh, just naturally make the disk from a function into a table, into a 2D matrix. Okay. So this is what I started out the class with. I'm going to actually uh, make an array out of it, a 2D matrix rather. So that's the transformation problem I have. I have to convert S1 through N into T1 through M. Now the indexing will be consistent. So here's the 2D array I'll build, okay. the array will be called dist. It will go from 0 to m and 0 through n. It will represent the source matrix and the index j will go across. This will represent the target string and the index i will go down. Okay. This will be filled with 0 through m. That will be filled 0 through n to start with. Okay. 
and the rest is pretty obvious. So instead of writing a recursive routine, I'll actually write a small function to fill in this array. And finally, just reading off this value will give me the array distance. So that's clear enough. Now, um, what else do I have to do? If I have to actually tell you how to edit S to turn it into T, or I have to draw that yellow path, which is the best path through this array, then I also have to maintain a record of the action I took. So there will be a second array apart from this, which will be called action. And action along the upper and left bands is nothing. There is no action. Or rather, you could think of it as, I don't need to know, because I, you know, it really inserts and deletes, but it doesn't really matter. So anyway, uh, there are four kinds of actions. There is um, shorten, insert, delete and uh, replace. Okay. Now, I could of course, in C++, I could say that, well, arbitrarily let shorten be represented by integer 0, this by integer 1. So I have this array with these four values. Fine. But the problem is that you know tomorrow if you find some other new action and you try to you know someone else is writing or updating your code, these the code meaning can change, and what you insert into the array is hidden deep inside your code, and it's just an integer which you stick into a matrix. It's generally bad to have magic integers inside your code, unless the integers are obvious ones like index minus one or index times two, things like that, okay. or two to the power p. Those kinds of constants are okay. But if you have an arbitrary association between values in your model world and you're turning that into integers, it's much better to use a construct that's provided in both C++ and Java. It's called an enumeration, although the support in C++ is not great. So the way to code that is to say enum and then give, you, give the name of a type. This will become a type. And then inside, by convention, it, those are written in uppercase. So you can say shorten insert delete and replace. So what does this statement do? It defines a new type called action. It's like the system had int, car, bool, float, double. Now the system knows of a new type called action. Okay. It's secretly an int, but you don't need to really know that yet. Okay. So now if you're writing some function, You can now say action act and other parameters. You can even return action from the function. You can declare a variable called act, you know, of type action anywhere in the code. If you print it out, you'll get an integer. So that's the bad part. Java fixes that. So in fact, what C++ will do is that it will secretly assign this 0, it will assign this 1, it will assign this 2, it will assign this 3. Okay. But the advantage is that if now you decide that you need a no action, none, you insert that and then the numbering changes, none becomes 0, this becomes 1 automatically. You don't need to reassign the numbers by hand and make a mistake. And inside the code, you could always say action act2 equals, uh, say, none. So you should not use an integer. You should really use that symbolic 
uh, variable or a constant rather, so that the right value goes into the variables. So that's uh, so what we'll have is we'll declare action to be a matrix of action. Hmm? No, they are just symbolic names. So what's the action you have to do at a point ij to proceed? Okay, which of the four choices gave me the best solution for ij? I just record that. Okay. So uh, let's look at the non-recursive code. Yes. There is something. So, so in C++ again, just like bool, enum is a syntactic comfort that's given to you, but internally enum uh, values are represented as ints. Okay. So you can freely assign between enums and ints and no one is any wiser. You print an enum variable, you get an integer output, so that's pretty bad. So in Java, enums really define a new type, even internally, and when you print in Java, if you printed shorten, you'd actually get the string shorten on screen. You'd not get zero. Yeah. And you cannot interassign between integers and enums. Yeah. So if in a switch loop, hmm. it's a switch from the recover to input in app. app. Hmm. Yes. So will it interpret it as case one, case two, case three? You shouldn't write case one, case two. You should say case shorten, case insert. So will it compile Yes, it'll compile compile correctly. That's the point. So sw switch is a prominent use of enums. So here goes. Uh, so any distance two uh, defines this action. Okay. Uh, none shorten delete insert replace. Okay. And very often to print this out uh, properly, programmers use the following device. Although I won't discuss it today uh, in much detail. So it will say uh, car star action strings okay so once you have that you can use an action variable to index into this array and print the correct string and you keep these two declarations side by side so that anyone updating one of them has to update the other as well Otherwise, there will be a bug. Okay. But let us not worry about that. The important thing is to look at the action definition. It is just a bunch of integers, but with symbolic names so that we can write code more cleanly and readably. Okay. So print is about the same as before, except that along the left and upper spine, I print the strings S and T also, so that we can see what is happening in the array, just like I did in the in the slide over here. So we'll actually print sitting and kitten along the upper and left edges. So main uh, here it's not recursive, so I've put the whole code inside main. Uh, S T R read as before. I insert the dummy character at the beginning as before. Remember rows correspond to T and columns correspond to S. Okay. So I have these two matrices. One is the dist matrix taking the place of the recursive function so that I can reuse values. And there's a matrix of actions, which is called action, the same size as dist. Okay. Now, uh, along the, let's see. So one thing I could do is I could say dist 0, 0 equal to 0 and action 0, 0 equal to none. You don't need any action to turn an empty string into an empty string. Otherwise, for i x equal to 1 to this dot size, okay. so remember what's going on here, i x is down the rows, so I am growing the target by inserting on an empty string. Okay. So I say something like action i x 0 equal to insert fine whereas here jx goes across 
So that I have to delete to bring it to an empty target. So here, okay. and now I start the job of filling in the inner cells of the two arrays. And the code is about the same as before. Now I and J start from one each. Okay, so I'm inside the region. I initialize best to infinity. If T i x is equal to S j x, then I have a shorter problem. Okay. So I look up, this is not a recursive call anymore. I'm just looking up entries in the matrix which have already been settled. Okay. And if I can improve my best solution, then I record the best solution, but I also remember the action. So action ij will be shortened. Okay. Otherwise, if the last two characters are not the same, so in that two-fold plan, let me get the convention right. Otherwise, you know, let's finish off the replacement, then come back to insert and delete and really do that correctly, the right way around. So replacement is where the last characters are not the same, and I solve a smaller problem, and I pay one unit for the replacement. If that is the best, its replacement is better than best, then I set action to replace. Okay. Now in these two cases, what's happening? If I say dist of, say, um, I think I've got it opposite. Dist of, no, uh, i and j minus 1. So that means I deleted something of the end of s. J goes along the top, right? So that's the delete option. Otherwise, if it's i minus 1 and j, then after the end, I have to insert something at the end of t after the recursive transformation is done. So this is OK. Fine. So each cell, action ij, will hold one of shorten, insert, delete, and replace. Right? And then at the end of it, I'll print. Uh, dist itself and I'll separately print action. Okay. So let's see how that ends up. Ah. Uh, 11 is that funny statement. I'm just going to get rid of it. So kitten and sitting, so this is what we get. So to turn an empty string into sitting takes those costs, okay. Uh, to turn uh, that string into empty string takes that cost and then as you can see the final cost is 3. Okay. So uh, how do we get all that? And then this is the action that is printed separately. Okay. Now this is the problem that this is not printing insert delete, it's printing integers. If I wanted to print the strings, then I have to look through that indirection array and do the right thing. Okay. I mean, I look at that uh, string array and then print the strings. But let's try to remember what's going on here. So I'm just going to put a comment so I can quickly look up. Okay. So see, in this, this vertical, this is none, no action required, empty to empty. This vertical spine is one of insertions. So insert is 3. Okay. That is a bunch of deletions to get to the empty string. So that's delete. Okay. And inside here are various possibilities. So the last thing here tells me that I have to do a insert. What do I have to insert? I have to insert G. Right. Now if I took the insert path Okay, then remember from the code that insertion happens when I, the, my recursive call is, is i minus 1 and j. Okay. So I record insert only if I, if the recursive call was i minus 1 and j. So in other words, because this was an insert, okay, I have to 
um, 3 and 2 here, right. So, this tells me that this action was insert, so I have to drop down to the next cell, okay, where the cost was 2. And that last insertion of G cost me 1, that is how I went from 2 to 3. Okay. Now, I go to this cell and the action there was 1, which was when do I put in an action of 1, which is shorten. Okay. Shorten means the last characters were the same, so both were shortened. So, if this was 1, that means from 2 I have to go to here. And the cost should be the same, because the last two characters are same. n is equal to n. Okay. So, can I write a code which traces back from mn and records all the edit operations that I had to make. Okay. So, let us try this out. So, suppose we write something like a void trace path, okay, where we will put a const matrix int dist and const matrix action. So, I will print out a bunch of things to explain to us what is going on. Now, how do I do this? So, I say for int m equal to that last entry, which is this dot size 1 minus 1. Okay. And you can put a comma if you want to define multiple variables. This will be this dot size 2 minus 1. Okay. How far do I go? I need to only go as long as m and n are both positive, otherwise I am done. So, this will be m say greater than 0 and n greater than 0 and the action, the changes to m and n will happen inside, one or the other may decrease. What do I do inside? Now, this time I have to do a switch on the action in the current cell. Okay. So, I say switch act mn. Okay, and there are four cases or uh, five cases. None will usually not arise. So, I can just say case shorten. I'm pretty sure Emacs has some some way to do this automatically. Okay, so those are the four cases. Now, if the action is shortened, then what do I have to do? I have to print out some stuff. Okay. So shorten happens only when the characters are the same. So I'll write something like uh, well, let me send in the strings as well. So, I will say um, S um, N okay, equal to that character and That was the action and I can step back now. So, what do I do? I do minus minus m minus minus m okay. and so on and for the others. So, in case of delete, I will say, so who do I delete from? I delete from s. The s is always the target of actions. Okay. So, I will say something like delete 
delete say s mm, n that okay and then i'll do minus minus n Similarly, I could try various things. Insert D. I hope this is the right convention. If you get wrong, it, you can fix it. I'll not do it too much. Okay. And replace is very similar to this. So now let's see how this works out. Um, at least one of them is decreasing, so at some point I should stop the loop. Uh, this is what? This is trace path. So trace path is called with S T this. Let's see if this compiles or not. And if it runs correctly. So insert T7 equal to G. Okay. Shorten N is N. Replace E not I. So replace E I. Okay. Then there will be those uh, T's, kitten and sitting, two T's are shared, so I just have to shorten it, even I, okay, and then replace K not equal to S, okay. So this is called a backtrace. So whenever you have a dynamic programming like solution, you have to keep track of how you got to the solution, and this action matrix can help you trace back the path from the final solution toward the initial point. And this sort of gives you a script, if you will, to turn one string into the other. That turns kitten into sitting. Okay. So any questions about dynamic programming? The first example, we'll do more. So is the problem totally clear now? So why did we start with a recursive solution? Because it's very natural to break down such a problem into saying what happened to the last position. Okay, just like factorial says to find n factorial, I'll just look at the last number n and then appeal to recursion to do the rest of the work for me. So similarly here, given two strings, you ask about the last position and then break down the problem into smaller parts. Now it turned out that recursive implementation was not a good idea because of massive repetition of subproblems. So we decided to cache the values of the subproblems in a in a matrix. And that made the problem very efficient. By the way, so how much time will this take? If the original strings are m versus n, then the time taken to fill in the matrix is proportional to mn. Each cell has only four cases and deals with only its three neighbors. So to fill in a cell takes constant time. Okay. But this quadratic time is still fairly bad. Okay. In the sense that on the web corpus, if you wanted to detect which page is very similar to which page, not only is it quadratic in the lengths of the two pages you are comparing, but you have to take every two pages from 10 billion pages. So in standard old computer science, an algorithm with running time 2 to the power n is bad. An algorithm with running time n factorial is terrible. But an algorithm with running time n cubed is fine. But in the age of web search and processing, an algorithm which has time n squared, where n is the number of pages, is pretty much impractical. So 
So the, an interesting problem is that given a web page, find the 10 pages closest to it, say. And you do that for all the web pages. So you realize that the size of the output is 10 times 10 billion. So if you had n pages, then the required output from you is for each page the 10 most similar pages. So the output is really 10 times n. But it seems like you have to do n squared comparisons to find those 10 n things. So there are very nice tricks to avoid that and to finish that computation in about n log n time. But that, that we teach in uh, elective courses. Okay. So anyway, so string edit distance is important. There are many other interesting problems around string edit distance. For example, uh, in genomics, a very important problem is given a set of strings, find one string whose edit distance to all of them is minimum. That's called the centroid string. Just like given a bunch of points, the centroid is its arithmetic mean. Okay. So it's like sum of squares of distances is minimized if you do that. Okay. It's the mean point. Or you can similarly define midoids or median points. Similarly for strings, now that you have a distance, we can start talking about centroid strings. Uh, unfortunately, the centroid string problem is quite complicated. So anyway, so those are some of the problems around string processing which are important. Now let's look at a second, actually somewhat simpler example of dynamic programming. So suppose I have a set of numbers okay. and That's fine. Yeah. And now I ask, is there a subset that adds up to, say, S, where S is a given, these are all integers. Then find, report the subset. Otherwise, report that there is no such subset. So how are we going to do this? And imagine, just for simplicity, assume that all the numbers are distinct, so it's a real set. So any ideas? So again, think of the last position or something. So suppose there is a subset that adds up to S. Each element AI is either in it or it's not in it. Right. So the way I'll set up the recursion and then do dynamic programming is, so it always helps to start out thinking recursively. And then if you feel that sub problems are massively shared or replicated, you should implement it as dynamic program. Okay. So the question I ask is, is A N uh, so let's say, let's say the, the sum is uh, say A and the subset is S. Okay, I'll just change the symbols a bit. Is N in S? Okay. Suppose yes versus no. Okay. If N is in S, then I can create a new problem which is given the elements a1 through an minus 1, is there a subset which adds up to s minus n? Uh, a minus uh, n. Okay. If no, then also I can now only use this, but I still have to make up a with it. So that's a very simple recursive way of thinking about the problem. And how do we write this recursively? So remember, my eventual answer was supposed to be only a Boolean. Is, the, is there a subset or isn't there a subset? What actual subset was picked, we can pack in later on through something like that action matrix or whatever. So I write something like bool. Uh, exist subset. 
So this is also a convention for naming things in your code. Uh, generally speaking, Boolean variables and functions should have a verb in their name. Okay. Is finished or exists subset. Whereas other things like quantities should not have verb. They should be noun like phrases. So in it, I'll pass a couple of things. What do I pass? Uh, the sum I have to target. Okay. The vector of int storing the set. It's a constant. I won't change it. Okay. That should be it, actually, if I play it right. Uh, let me not pass it by reference. I'll actually keep the code like a pure function. That's it. So in both cases, the set will be shrunk by one. Right. So I do something like, I don't know if popback returns the last element. It should, but I'm not sure. I have to look up the manual. So all I'll do is say that uh, int a n is equal to set uh, set dot size minus one. Popback might do the same thing, but then I'll do set dot popback to remove that last element. I could probably say int a n equal to popback. So see, both cases the last element is removed, right? And now I say return. Return what? Return exist subset uh, sum set. Set has been mangled, right? Or sum minus a n and set. Any one of those cases? Any one of those cases there is a subset exists? The answer is yes. So it's the odd of those two. Fine. Except that suppose I want to keep track of what I did, whether n is in or not. Huh? Yes. Huh? That is the code. What else do you Huh, that's a good point. So, what is the escape clause? If sum greater than 0 and, well, uh, if set dot size equal to 0, Then, if the sum is zero, you have done it. If the sum is not zero, you can't do it. Okay. So, return if the set is empty, then the only sum you can make up is zero. So, if the sum is zero, then you return true. If the sum is not zero, you return false. So that's the escape clause. Well, uh, what I'm saying is that whether a n belongs or not, it will go out of the set anyway. Uh, if I pick it as part of the set, then I have to, so remember this is a smaller set now because the popback has already been done. Then I have to try to target sum minus a n, otherwise I have to target sum. Any one of them works, I can make, you know, there exists a subset with the correct sum. Okay, but if I want to keep track of what's happening, that will lead to some more code. But this will return the correct value, I think. Okay. If I want to keep track of which ones I have included, then I'll say add now a mutable vector of ints saying which have been included as the last argument. And of course, all recursive calls have to also pass in included. Okay. 
Not only that, now it can't look so nifty because I have to separate out the two cases. Okay. So I have to say something like bool um, without equal to this. Okay. And then bool with equal to that. And I have to return with or without. But before that, I have to record in, in include what I have included. Okay. So I have to say something like if with, then uh, um, in dot push back a before you return now it's possible that both of them end up true you can make the sum with and without maybe if it's a true set then maybe not but it depends whether there can be negative elements or not all kind of mess but what you say is if width is true, then I'll say that I included the element A. That's definitely correct. There's no problem with that. So I'd like you to trace what happened from only the white stuff to then include the yellow separately so as to not get too confused. So if you drop the yellow stuff, then it should be clear that what I'm saying is, is there a subset which adds up to A? Well, yes, under two conditions. One is that AN is in S. And the remaining elements can, there is some subset which adds up to A minus A n, or A n is not in S, and therefore I can look for that and sum up to A. If, if either of these return true, then the answer to this is true, okay, with or without. So let's code this up recursively and see what happens. I'll just read it in from scene. Let me read the set from and then the, the sum target from the command line. Few things to enter. So I'll say something like
to let's do one thing. I just wanted to check one particular thing. <coughs> just to see if popback works directly then. Oh, set dot popback returns a vector itself. Okay, never mind. Yeah. So now inside exist subset, I'll implement that recursive call, um, which is if size uh, set dot size equal to zero. And return target equal to zero. Yeah. That is like C out, except that it does not wait for a new line to flush output to the screen. Okay. It is an, if you do not like it, I will just replace it by C out and put a new line, otherwise, it does not show sometimes. Okay. So, subset sum, I am supposed to pass the entries, uh, the set. So let's say I have, uh, I don't know, 2, 3, 7, 11, okay. So can a subset of say 5 be achieved? Yes. Can a subset of 8 be achieved? No. Now, so now let us put the tracing code to see what is included and what is not. So, suppose I have the inclusions there, okay. and what I will do is bool without equals. with that okay. if I say if with then with or without and here I will just make up a empty inclusion set, I will call that and then finally I have to do my printing, let us see what I have handy, uh, printing big kind of stuff, uh, arrays, not GCD, uh, maybe quick sort perhaps to find my eternal print class, we should really make it a header. I do that. And of course, if the thing cannot be achieved, then nothing is printed. 
if you can achieve the sum which is 5, then it is 2 and 3. Okay. So, it knows which ones to add up. So, this thing starts becoming fun if you add a bunch of things. Okay. Now, there is a generalization of this where you can use, use each element multiple times. And a common use of that is making change. So, I have to make up an amount out of 1 rupee, 2 rupees, 5 rupees, 10 rupees and so on. Can you do it or can you not do it? Now, of course, if you have 1 rupees, you can do anything in infinite number. Okay. But in other cases, you may not be able to make exact change for an amount. Okay. So, that is a natural application of this kind of trick. So, try to extend this code to deal with uh, change making. 